Welcome to The Struggle is Real, a show for 20-somethings that are trying to figure out adulting. I'm your host, Justin Peters. Each episode, we focus on solving a problem that we will face throughout this defining decade that wasn't covered in the classroom. This could include topics about our career, health, relationships, and money. Let's get into it. How would you feel about retiring five years earlier than planned? 10 years? What about 20 years? This probably raises some skeptical eyebrows, but hundreds of people are doing this through a movement called FIRE. Financial independence, retire early. Inside FIRE groups, it's common to hear of couples who retired in their mid-40s, and many of these stories are coming from individuals who never commanded six-figure jobs. With some time, discipline, and understanding of basic financial concepts, I believe you can do this as well. Joel Leary is here with me today to talk about his experience with FIRE and how he's found balance with this popular movement. By listening to this episode, you'll hear us discuss the epiphanies Joel's had during his three-year sabbatical, how he built and continues to grow his real estate portfolio, and why he believes happiness is a choice, along with a good story to back it up. I hope you'll enjoy my conversation with the early riser, financial blogger, Mr. You'll Never Get Me Down, Joel O'Leary. Joel, my man, how are you? Hey, good. How are you? I I am doing excellent. It was a rough week in Texas last week with the whole power outage thing. Uh, but I was thinking about this conversation. And I was so excited about this conversation. Every single time we t- we talk, uh, my day is just night and day difference afterwards. Uh, so I'm I'm really pumped. We actually first connected over a year ago before this podcast was even a thing because I heard you on another podcast and you were taking a sabbatical at that point in time. And I was just starting to think about taking a sabbatical of my own. So I reached out and um, I wasn't expecting to get a quick response back, but you literally just said, yes, that sounds great. I would love to chat. Here's my phone number. Call me whenever. Uh, So I want to lay some context here. Uh, I read a blog post that I think will put the listener into where you were. You were about a year into your sabbatical at that point in time. And um, at the, at what I'm gonna read is when you just started your sabbatical and what you were thinking. And it was so funny because I think I was in the exact same boat. So you said, I worried that if I change, if I quickly change jobs or joined a new company, I could find myself in the exact same situation again a couple years down the road. I don't have a work, I don't have a workplace problem. I have a me problem. So I set my sights on <laughs> taking a sabbatical, a full reset, a career break. I wanted to discover my life would be like without. With, without completely removing work from the equation. So what was going on in your head at that point in time? <laughs> I wrote that. Dang. You did. <laughs> um, that's cool. Yeah, you know, oh, you, can I just go back for a second? Because yeah, I just want to tell you, dude, um, after I recorded that, that first podcast that you heard me on, um, I probably got four or five other people reaching out to me and I love it when people reach out of the blue and dude, mad, like props to you for just putting yourself out there and like, uh, reaching out and asking people for phone calls and feedback and stuff like that. So you stuck out as someone who wants to learn, wants to like, um, you know, obviously you want to fail forward and you're not scared of, uh, making these big life-changing moves. Uh, but as well, like you, you do your thorough research. So anyway, no, I'm stoked you reached out and um, I had a really good conversation the first time we chatted. So I want to help anyone out there who's uh, thinking about going on a sabbatical and um, I'm, I'm not going to push you either one way or the other, <laughs> like, but I will say that a lot of the things that you realize, a lot of the epiphanies that you have Uh, during a sabbatical, you can actually have those same epiphanies while staying at work. So you do not need to take time off to improve your life, to be happier, to make a career change. You can do all that stuff uh, without, you know, quitting your job and like, you know, uprooting your whole life. So anyway, um, yeah, I guess... I don't know. Um, My work was wasn't the problem. I didn't want to blame work because work is if everyone has to work in life work is necessary in life so I really wanted to focus on me coming into like my time off everyone started asking me like so why are you quitting what's like why are you leaving us and um I I hate the word quit because I'm not a quitter and I I like um gritting through hard times and taking on challenges and stuff like that but work was sort of 
I don't know, it was in the way of me figuring out what I wanted to do in life. So that's why I needed to just remove it from my life to figure out, you know, what to do next. Um, I'll tell you another thing. I was, I, I mean, I was very scared. Um, one of the things, one of my fears in life, and this is a complete irrational fear. One of my fears in life is to run out of money. And um, what a weird, dumb fear, because I've got more money than most people my age. Um, I'm incredibly blessed in life. I like the, re the reality is the chances of me running out of money are so slim. So why was I so scared of it? And I was so scared that um, I would never leave my job. I was really nervous. You hear people saying, oh, don't leave your job until you got another one lined up. What are you going to do with your gap in income? So when like a lot of people say, well, if you're scared of something, face those fears directly. I went from um, receiving an income every single, like every two weeks, I got like a paycheck delivered to me. Um, I turned that off. When you quit your job, you have zero dollars delivered to you every two weeks. Can you imagine your paycheck saying zero dollars every two weeks? Yeah. And that goes on for, I missed like 50 paychecks in a row. Zero dollars, zero dollars, zero dollars. Talk about facing your fears. Um, and I quickly realized like, oh, I'm not scared of going broke. That is such a dumb fear. I need to like reset how I make decisions because money should not re like heavily factor, be a, be a big factor in like my decision making. So sorry for the ramble. Wow. <laughs> that's, that was... I sort of forgot the original question. But yeah, that's, that's my thought process at the time. Yeah, perfect preamble, because I was going through a lot of the same situation. Um, we have the exact line of thinking where I've never left a job without having another job lined up. Um, I also have that fear of having zero dollars in my bank account. And it took a couple weeks, um, maybe even a couple months of the zero dollar paycheck to come through. But I finally came to peace with it. I took uh, ended up taking about seven months off total. Um, wow. I'm back. I'm back to work now. But the whole purpose of it was just to give me some white space. I could never, I felt like I couldn't catch up and, uh, you know, give myself a break to really think about what I wanted to do next with life. And yes. I heard a lot of that same parallel whenever I was listening to you, where you were at with your certain journey as well. You know, you, you put it very well about what your next step is in life. I think um, going into it, I was a little, um, uh, I think I was a little confused about who I was. Mm. And I think I didn't like, you hear a lot of people when they're wrapped up in work and they're so far into their jobs and careers, they're like, I just don't even know what my passion is anymore. I need to go back and find my passion. And I used to do all these fun hobbies and I used to do this and that, and I wanted to travel. And where did that go? So um, sometimes, or what I did was I quit my job and then I went on this mission to like find out who I was. I even called my mom and I was like, mom, like, um, what did I want to be when I was a kid? Like, give me some, you know, help here. And she wasn't any help at all. She said, oh yeah, well, you didn't really want to be anything. Like, uh, your favorite color was blue and you really liked the texture of, you know, um, you know, surfaces. I'm like, mom, no, I want career. Like, tell me what I should do next. So anyway, um, I sort of, I reached this epiphany that um, instead of going back through your past and figuring out who you were, um, picture the you like 10, 20 years from now, picture mm -hmm. the life that they have and um, then build towards that. So it's sort of like um, building your new self versus figuring out your old self. And that was a mindset shift that I really had to, that the sabbatical helped me make and helped me make very, very quickly. So um, instead of focusing inwards on like, ah, oh, what is my passion and what can the world provide to me so that I can be happy? It was now more about actually, what do I need to explore and who do I need to become and what out there can I go and what is within my reach now? Hmm. So that sort of, uh, that was my next like big epiphany. Yeah, no, I, I read that blog post too. I think it was like um, seven epiphanies from your sabbatical. And the one that I really, I, I, that last, the last one was funny and you already told us it was, maybe I couldn't have all, maybe I could have had all these epiphanies without even taking time off work, which I just thought was, <laughs> was hilarious. But your second one you wrote was, 
finding yourself isn't productive. Instead, build your future self. And I thought that was so, so thoughtful in that approach. Because you're right, it is about, you know, building the future self. And that's what that time off gave me is to really think about how do I want to continue to spend my time? Because I'm on a path of financial independence like you are. Um, And, you know, once you get closer to it, you start realizing, what the hell am I going to do after it? (laughs) Like, what do I want to do here? So, So what were some of the things that you did on your sabbatical? Like you said, you went out and, you know, tried to start building your future self. Did you explore some certain hobbies? I know you took um, a cool summer trip um, up the West Coast and stayed in Montana as well. So what were some uh, things that you did that first year off? Yeah, so um, one thing was instead of, uh, so I was really worried that I would go back to work right away. I was worried, and this is so weird, like the two weeks that you put in your notice and then shortly afterwards, you'll get so many job offers. It's ridiculous. People are like, oh, you quit your job? Why don't you join this company? Hey, I heard this is opening. And all of a sudden you you get all these offers and you're like, oh, I want to join that company. And the, you know, I was worried that I'd go right back into a position that would eventually be the same. Another means to an end. So what I did was I quit in March and then I immediately booked overseas tickets to Australia, New Zealand in November, December that year. Mm. So knowing that I can't just go get a new job because I can't go get a new job and then like they go on to go on leave right away, like long leave, six weeks off. So um, it was sort of like a forced time off. So I booked all this travel and just stuffed my year with stuff to do so that I wouldn't think about work and go back. Going back to work, I say this lightly, but it's kind of the easy button. Mm, It's kind of like going back to a comfort zone. You can go and get a job and, you know, go and be comfortable again. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted to face my fears and really commit to this time off. So the first thing I did was just book a ton of travel and traveling. Oh, man, you I mean, whether you go for one week or one month, you you, uh, you know, explore yourself, you see things in a different light, you meet a whole bunch of new different types of people, and you figure out all these weird, cool things about yourself. Um, One other thing I did was start to write a little bit. Um, I was already writing sort of a daily note to people, and we can talk about that in a little bit. But um, then I started to write these longer form blog posts. I kind of thought, um, okay, so I'm going to take a year off. And then when I'm interviewing my next job, whatever that future thing would be, they're going to ask me, uh, so what did you do this past year? And I'm going to have to come up with some pretty dang good like (laughs) reasons. So I thought I should probably document everything that I do. I should document like where I go, what I learned so that I can draw on all this information back when I'm in the interview chair. So um, I started this, you could call it a journal, but it's really more just like writing to get my thoughts out. And uh, that led to some pretty cool stuff and actually even led to my, you know, sort of new career or hobby or whatever you want to call it. So uh, yeah, writing stuff down and just continually learning. Um, I make a bunch of phone calls, just like you, dude. I, again, like, I'm so proud of you for starting this podcast and reaching out to everyone. This is like, this is like a free college course (laughs) that you're doing. You so much good information comes from that. I did the same thing. I just reached out to everyone I could, um, online networks, um, mentors, mentors, friends, you got someone to refer. Cool. I'll talk to them. I'll talk to them. You never know where these paths lead. And, um, yeah, so I just made some really cool connections that way. I joined a mastermind group. Um, yeah, just really interesting stuff. So I don't know. I kind of just, uh, opened a bunch of doors. That's yeah. really all it did. And I, I think that's a good strategy. I remember you telling me that advice as well. And I remember specifically, you told me about writing things down because of that exact same reason. And I just started a journal right before that. Um, it was like beginning of January. And um, now that I have a whole year of journaling, I just journal every day. It could be about the day itself. It could be something I want to consent, continue thinking about. I just write it like at least a paragraph worth of um, of stuff every single day, just as like a future jogging memory. And now that I have one year down, I go back and, and read the journal entry from the year before. And it's so funny because you came up in my journal like two weeks ago. And I was like, man, 
I talked to this guy named Joel. It was such a fun conversation. He's so interesting. He gave me a lot of great advice on, on sabbaticals. We should stay connected with him. If you haven't reached out to him recently, you should reach back out to him. <laughs> so here you we are. You wrote that note to yourself? Yes. <laughs> yes. That's awesome. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if that's man manifestation or what it is, but uh, here we are having this conversation. So, <laughs> um, Dude, it is manifestation. Um, if you write down in the morning every single day, I will be happy today. I will look for three good things instead of um, you know three bad things. That is manifestation. If you do that for 30 days straight, you will wake up the next day and you'll look for three good things automatically. It's just yes. about getting in a habit. So yeah, absolutely. Your notes um, written down, it just, uh, it fast tracks your uh, personal development. So Agreed. I love that. So early life for you, um, you mentioned your mom. It seems like your mom had a major influence on um, you and especially around financial literacy. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, growing up? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so my parents, uh, let's see, um, they got married when they were, I think they were 19. Um, yeah, I had my, my big brother right away. And then four kids, actually, all in a row. I'm the second of four. So my mom was uh, 20. I think she was 25. And she had four kids um, already. And uh, so my dad had to um, drop out of college and sort of um, support the family. He got a job and um, we weren't I guess we weren't struggling, struggling, but we certainly didn't have any money or anything like that growing up. I shared a room with my um, brothers and sisters um, and then my brothers almost all the way up until through high school. So anyway, um, my mom was just really good at budgeting. Uh, and um, so she taught us how to budget. She taught us how to save uh, slowly. Um, we were raised in a, in a Christian home. So we went to church and um, we learned how to give to charity and tithe and um, sort of set aside a portion of our income for the future. And uh, yeah, that just set the foundation to a good, I don't know, savings plan throughout my life. And um, yeah, so she, she was a big help with that. Um, my dad, more so on the investing side, he's uh, really interested in uh, real estate and, um, you know, looking at the stock market and stuff like that. So um, we even now have a lot of conversations about that. And, um, you know, we're not, he's not like a genius or terribly smart in these things or coming up with these brand new investment strategies. And like I said, they're, they're certainly not made of money or like making million millions or anything. Um, but just uh, just studying slowly and um, developing good financial habits. I, I credit my parents to that for sure. Yeah. yeah, no. And and I don't think you necessarily have to be super intellectual to be financially savvy. A lot of it is really simple, really boring stuff. And it sounds like both your parents kind of taught you the simple, boring things. I know uh, <laughs> one rule that was in your household was this 45% of you the or 45 of the money you make goes to savings, 45% you can you can use on spending, and then 10% goes to charity. And your mom also, she she had good setup rules for that. But she also had some discipline as well. What about if you miss school? <laughs> yeah, uh, you've done your research. Um, yeah, so <laughs> some funny things. So um, my parents taught me all these all these good financial lessons. One of them was the um, ten percent goes to charity, and then the out of the ninety percent left that you have, um, forty five percent of it goes to savings. Forty five percent of it goes to like you can spend on whatever you want. So like right out the gate, I was always saving kind of like half my income. Um, but um, more than that, my parents taught us responsibility, um, responsibility to contribute um, to like our community and our house. Like we always did chores and, um, you know, cook dinner with the family. And, you know, like I remember working a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of chores. Some of them paid, some of them, most of them not paid. Um, and then uh, consequences as well. So um, if I miss school, <laughs> yeah, my mom uh, actually calculated how much it would cost for me to go to school every day. And I think it was like, I don't know, $6 a day or something like that. So like if we miss school, she threatened to charge us for uh, missing school, like if I work up late or whatever. So yeah, there was a consequence to everything we did. If I missed cooking dinner for the family, I'd buy dinner for the family. Um, these are, you know, these are big things and getting takeout for $40 for the entire family when you're 15 or 16 is a big deal. I was working at McDonald's only earning, you know, $25 for the whole shift. 
uh, you know, t a big uh, financial consequence is, uh, yeah, anyway, so it sort of drilled in all these lessons. Um, another one was uh, my mom wouldn't let me drive her car when we got our license until I showed her a bank balance statement with $800 in it. And that was the deductible for, uh, sorry, that, that was like the, you know, deductible for our car insurance, um, which is really smart now that I think about it. Yes. But um, yeah, and so she just knew that if we had a crash somewhere, we had the money to cover it because mm. she certainly didn't have the money to cover it. She just built this financial responsibility into us as, you know, teenagers. I know people now in their 30s and 40s, they don't have that much money in their bank account. They can't even cover their insurance deductible. So anyway, um, yeah, these are just small little lessons, but had massive ripple effect now, you know, 20 years later in life. Mm, that's super cool. Apparently McDonald's paid off too, uh, making five bucks an hour. <laughs> you ended up saving a good chunk of change by the end of high school and you ended up buying a property with your parents. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, pretty cool. My, uh, parents, I was just coming out of high school. I was 18 and, uh, my parents wanted to buy their first rental property. Um, you know, and I think they probably had the money to do it by themselves. But, um, by that point, myself and my older brother had a bit of money saved up as well. So we s sort of devised a partnership, um, 50%, my parents, 25% me, 25% my brother. And we'd, we'd buy this rental property. It was pretty small. Um, it was, uh, $200,000, but uh, man, that sort of like really got me thinking, oh, instead of saving and saving and saving this 45% of my you know, income that I keep saving, um, saving is really means investing and investing. This money can make money and then it'll grow and grow and grow. It was a pretty small amount of time. I can't remember five, six, seven grand that I had. Um, we bought, I bought a quarter of a rental property. Um, what's cool from there though, is like, um, learning how it all works and just watching it grow slowly. My mom made me do all the books. We uh, sat down with a pen and paper and, you know, calculated all the incoming cash, like all the incoming rent minus all the expenses. Here's the cash flow. Here's the trend over the year. Here's the trend over two years. Here's my, you know, seven grand down deposit, the payment. Um, you know, now it's worth, you know, 13,000. How did that work? So like, I don't know, my mind sort of clicked on like, huh, if I save enough money, I can actually put it to work for me to, you know, I don't know, like grow wealth, the slow and boring way. Yeah. And so, yeah, man, that's, uh, that's how that all started out. And you got into real estate now, how many properties do you own total? A few days ago, my wife and I just um, invested in our 10th, um, real estate partnership. Nice. So yeah, yeah. And I haven't really even announced that yet. And, um, we're still sort of in the closing phase, but we've funded it and we've been accepted. Um, so rental properties specifically, we have five, um, we after selling a couple and then, um, private partnerships, we have an, another five and, uh, private partnerships are more like everyone investors pool their money together. And then you all go in on a group project um so one apartment complex let's say and uh i've found that that's a more passive form of investment because i don't have to directly be involved in managing the property um i certainly do due diligence look over my number look over all the numbers and i evaluate it as if i was buying it myself however um it's uh yeah it doesn't require my daily involvement which i like a lot better than um you know managing individual rental properties yeah, I can only imagine you. It seems like you're trying to protect your time a lot now, um, while still making your money work for you. So that's kind of an interesting concept. Is it like a REIT essentially, but like for a much smaller group of people? Um, yes, because um, so REITs publicly traded, and um, so you so it's governed by the SEC. Uh, everything they do is um, public. And um, they have to meet certain guidelines and all this stuff. And uh, the shares uh, are bought and sold sort of willy-nilly on an open exchange. That's, that's a REIT. Uh, private partnership is different. They still register with the SEC. They say, hey, SEC, I'm going to collect investors' funds to go and do this. Um, however, don't worry. All of these investors are very sophisticated and they're high net worth individuals and all that stuff. And they're, they're um, you know, experienced in real estate already. 
Um, so we're not going to share anything with the public. Once they buy in, these are non-transferable shares. You can't just go and sell. So you're in it for the long haul. It's a private partnership, um, a private you know, company structure. I basically own a share or multiple shares within an LLC that is divided up between a set group of investors and those investors only. So yes, it's um, think of it as an invite only kind of real estate experience. Um, sounds really exclusive and fancy and whatever, but the reality is there's a ton out there. You just need to go and find the right people to be involved with. And so, yeah. So, so how do you, how do you find those opportunities? Is this just you networking with inside the real estate investing community? Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Basically, um, yeah, I went on to Bigger Pockets. Uh, Bigger Pockets is an online real estate investing community. Um, I googled syndication. That's the that's the term. It's a it's like a private syndicate, and um, I found about I don't know fifty people with syndication in their title, or they uh, they basically set up these partnerships. Um, narrowed that down to about twenty. Set up phone calls with them all. Narrowed that down to about ten you know, started to like really investigate the deals that they were coming across. I got on their private email lists. Then um, I started evaluating and jumping on these um, presentations that they would give when they're about to buy a specific property and just research, 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 narrowed that down to one or two, and then finally just bought, bought into one. Um, so it's kind of like <laughs> just a ton of research, a ton of outreach, um, making yourself known to people. I think uh, a lot of people want to get into real estate, but they don't actually make the moves to go and do stuff. Um, that's This requires making the moves to go and do stuff. No one's going to come and deliver you an opportunity in your lap. That's, I mean, people will. That's called REITs and things like that. Anyone can buy in. But if you want something private, you got to go find it yourself. So why choose a private partnership or even the real estate route versus just parking your money if you're wanting to stay fairly passive and hands off just parking your money in some kind of low cost index fund well you know that's um i wish i wished you asked me this question 10 years ago because um the truth is um i never saw another option other than real estate um you know my my grandpa was in real estate my uncle was in real estate i was just i don't know and australia is very real estate focused as um you know my upbringing so I don't know, I never really saw another way. And then um, it hit me one day, I actually did an analysis on that rental property I bought with my parents. And um, I looked at, we owned it together for about, I think it was 18 years. And I looked and uh, the, the return, as best as I can figure, um, the year on year return for the 18 years was like, I don't know, 10%, something like that, nine and a half, ten percent 10%. And then I looked at the S&P 500 or like total stock market index, a very boring index fund um, achieved the exact same return over those 18 years. And if I just stuck my money in there, um, you know, it would have grown the exact same rate. So like, um, why? There is no reason why. I, I really wish I did start investing in the stock market earlier versus real estate, but it is what it is now. Um, I think uh, real estate investment gives you a little bit more control. These private partnerships, I can evaluate the, the numbers. I, can, I have sort of a say in um, what projects I want to buy into and which ones I don't. Um, I've got a set of that investing criteria that I've developed over the years. And if they meet that criteria and we're on the same page, I'll invest. If not, I don't have to. Um, the stock market and general REITs, um, someone else is playing with your money and you don't know exactly where it is. So that's all there's, uh, you know, but it's not like I think I can beat the market or anything like that. I'm certainly sure. not trying to, yeah, I, I wish I had more money in the stock market. Makes sense. So let's shift gears to fire. Um, first of all, what the hell is fire? <laughs> could you explain <laughs> that? I, 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 could you explain that in a, a sentence or two for the listeners? Sure. Uh, FIRE, it's an acronym for financially, financial independence, retire early. Um, the most important part is the financial independence. Uh, I think uh, people want to reach a point where they don't have to worry about money for the rest of their life. 
And um, so it's basically re like building up such a sum of money and, and a pool of assets like this nest egg that it can actually fund your day-to-day -day living. That's when you're financially independent. Um, the retire early portion is basically if you get started really early in life, um, you, can, you can actually quit your job and stop working earlier than your regular retirement age. So FIRE is this sort of, um, I don't know, movement. It's a collection of people who are like shooting for financial independence, um, you know, and trying to achieve it relatively early in life. Hmm. So what, what, what is relatively early? I know you being in the personal finance space, blogging in the personal finance space, I'm assuming you've met some, some people that are pretty passionate about FIRE. What is a typical age that people are shooting for? Oh, uh, dude, it's, it's all over the map. I think... Um, what people are pretty much drawn to the fire movement because they um, want to retire as early as possible. And that's how they find it. They're like, dang, I need to get out of what I'm doing. I want to retire. I don't like what I'm doing. Um, so it's a, it's a bit of an immature mindset because they think um, that achieving financial independence is magically going to improve their life. Um, but like, kind of like our sabbatical conversation, we just already talked about quitting your job just means you have to find something else. So it's just like the next section of your life. So the longer people stay on this financial independence path, the more they realize, um, it's more a lifestyle versus an event. Financial independence isn't, um, isn't a once off thing. It's sort of like you, you live your life by a set of guidelines, um, you asked about relatively early, I think, what is the average retirement age? 67, 70, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so anything under that is considered early. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people in their 40s who have woken up and realized they have no life savings. And now they're jumping on this um, financial independence path, learning how to save, invest, make a little bit more, and they can retire when they're 50. That's 10 years. It's pretty amazing stuff. If you do this, when you, if you start in your thirties, maybe you can retire in your forties. If you start yeah. in your twenties, maybe you can retire in your thirties. So it's all over the map. I think the news articles um, like to shove it in people's face and they like to expose people that have retired when they're like, you know, 32 or something silly like that. But um, the truth is everyone's different and you can retire whenever you want. It's got nothing to do with your time. And it's more to be, it's more about um, shooting fi financial independence and building a life that you really enjoy, no matter how much money you have. Sure. Sure. So um, you're, I, I don't know how long you decided to take your sabbatical for, but you are still currently on your sabbatical. So have you reached <laughs> fire? What is your current state? Um. So first of all, um, financial independence. So they, they basically, it solves two problems. Number one is like figuring out when you want to retire. And number two is figuring out how much you need to have um, to be able to retire. And then the two will cross at one point. Um, for me, the figuring out how much I want to have, because I'm so young, I don't really know how much I need to retire. I know sort of a minimum and I know I'll never need millions, 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 millions. Um, but my exact um, financial independence number hasn't quite been nailed down yet. So anyway, um, I guess I'm going just by saying, uh, I don't know if I'll retire in the next few years. Um, I certainly won't stop living life and doing what I want to do and pursuing the jobs I want to pursue. So, um, so from a, like, a career perspective, I'm still trying to find things that I can get into. Uh, as far as a money perspective, I've reached a point of inevitability. And what that means is that I will probably retire early, um, no matter what job I pursue. I could go work at Starbucks for the rest of my life. And just given my current assets and real estate investments, they will continue to grow and grow and grow. And I will have more money than I need by the time I'm in my 60s. So um, without doing much work at all, I can, I can retire and retire early. Um, so with that realization that, uh, you know, it's inevitable for me, um, I can slow down. I can uh, actually just take a step back and take more time off and work part-time. You talk about my sabbatical. I, I took it 12 months and then realized 
it didn't really have a big impact on my finances. So I thought I'll take another 12 months. <laughs> and then um, I got hit up by a friend who said, Hey, you want to work on some movie sets? We'll pay you $350 a day. And you can just like, you know, just like help people and move chairs around and stuff. And I was like, sure. It was just sort of like a part-time gig. Um, I had a, someone reach out to me and say, Hey, you want to, you want to blog for us? You want to start writing some articles? So that's been really cool. Uh, as of right now, I work part-time for them. They've got a contract with me, which is nice, but, uh, yeah, I haven't returned to full-time work yet, which is amazing. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I subscribe to fire and I love the fire movement because I feel like it gets that one big obstacle out of the way, which is this money issue. And now you don't have to worry about, you're not fighting two, two fronts here. Also trying to make enough money to, um, to afford the lifestyle that you live currently and also saving enough money to afford the lifestyle that you want to have eventually while you're not working. And it seems like you kind of knocked out half of that equation. You have the nest egg set in place for the future you. Really all you got to do and probably not even really have to cons- you know, have that much consideration on this, but make enough to get by so that your expenses are covered um, year over year with what's going on here. I, it, it sounds like, and through some of the research that like, you probably don't need to rush back to retirement anytime soon. I feel like every one of your decisions of, um, uh, what you do and how you spend your time has been solely based on what I find that interesting. Does that sound like something that I want to do? And if it pays me a little bit, cool. Awesome. Sounds great. <laughs> Dude, that's so cool because um, I used to make decisions and certainly career decisions based on how much money I'd make. Um, how much does it cost? I don't want to make decisions based on money anymore. It's It frustrates me that um, I have to think about, oh, how much is this going to cost me? Or how much is that going to make me? Um, I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> I, may, I want to like base my decisions based on happiness and like my family. Like, hey, wife, do you want to go do this? Cool. Let's go figure it out and do it. Um, versus always how much money, money, money. So yeah, removing money from the equation. Um, I will say this, um, I got a head start early than most people. I think if you're in your 30s and you've got no savings, you, you've got some work to do before you reach a point where you can relax a little bit. Um, so I'm blessed to be able to um, say that I've, I've reached a point where I can relax a little bit. Um, actually, the epiphany came. This is pretty cool. Um, I was sitting around with my buddy at a bar once and he's like this is mid sabbatical and he said when are you going to go back to work and I was like well here are my options he actually said when are you going to retire when are you going to have enough money to like fully call it quits and I was like well here are my options I can go back to sales tech sales I can get a job that earns 200 grand a year or something like that and um, I could power through our savings invest it really wisely and I can probably retire in like five years and be set for life Um, or you know what, if I slow it down a little bit, um, I could probably go out and get a job that pays maybe $100,000 a year and retire in 10 years. Or if I slow it down even further, if I go and get a job that pays me only $50,000 a year, I could probably retire in 20 years pretty comfortably, pretty easily. And this is this all done with the calculator and, you know, fire calculators and stuff like that. It's not, you know, these are round numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, I started thinking realistically right now in Los Angeles, there's only five or six companies out there, probably within my specialty that would pay me $200,000 um, a year to go back and work for them. Um, the $100,000 a year ban, there's probably a couple hundred companies in Los Angeles that I can go and get a job. $50,000 a year, there are probably thousands of companies in Los Angeles that I can go work for. So if I look at my options, do I want to choose this really narrow bucket? Or do I want to like explore like I could do anything. And so what excites me more is that I can do anything and I'm still going to retire one day, I'd rather fill my life with doing things that I want to do, versus a short time of doing things that I really, really don't want to do anymore. Mm. So, dude, I want to go back to sales one day. I think sales is um, in me. I love customer service. I like dealing with people, all that good stuff. I'm naturally good at it. I'm skilled in sales. And that's where a lot of money can be made and problems can be solved and value can be given and all that good stuff. So I haven't closed the book on sales. However, um, I want to explore all this other stuff in the meantime, because it's so cool, regardless of the money. So anyway, I agree. 
That's awesome. And I feel like there's some myths around fire as well. Um, and the two big myths that I hear pretty often is that you have to like live this life of extreme frugality. Um, that's one piece. And that like, you can only spend money on the things that you really need to spend money on to get you through to the next day and, you know, rent and groceries and, and, and gas, and you can't go out and do anything else with your life. And then the other side of the coin is you have to be a high earner. You have to be someone that makes, you know, hundred K 200 K plus. Um, I think both those myths are exactly that myth, but I'd love to get your thoughts on it. Um, what do you think about extreme frugality? Is that something that you subscribed to all these years while you were in your quest to fire or how was your lifestyle? Um, I think I've, I don't want for much in life. So I think I'm blessed a little bit. I think there are people out there that want fancy stuff and expensive stuff and they think something's cool because it's expensive. I just don't. So um, that's, that's just a mindset shift that anyone could make. Um, you could call it extreme frugality, but the truth is I have everything that I need mm. and I do everything that I want to do. Um, I think um, when people talk about extreme frugality, they're thinking about all the things that are taken away from them versus the things that are in addition to them. So for example, um, a two car household if I tell them, hey, you could probably do without one of your cars, they would freak out and they quickly think about all the reasons why they need two cars and all the things that is going to stop them from doing. And like they're thinking about the negative impact and the things that are being taken away from their life. On the flip side, I would encourage them instead to think about all the things that would add to their life. One, they would communicate more because you need to negotiate around one car schedule. Two, they'd probably carpool more and save. They'd certainly be saving a lot of money. Hey, maybe some more um, outdoor activities like bike riding to work or, you know, walking and to things that were things within a one mile radius. There's really no need to drive anyway. It would, in, you know, it would help you slow down your life. There are a ton of benefits to being like a one car household, but they don't see them. They only see like, no, these things are going to be taken away from my life. This is a, so anyway, while some people would say, um, oh, that's so frugal. I just, I don't think so. I think um, just change your mindset a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the, the other one, the, the income one is really funny. Like I, you know, I threw out $200,000 a year for the sales job, but really I, I made over $200,000 a year, one year of my life. The rest, I really, I'm, I'm not even had a massive salary. My wife has never had a massive salary. So you can achieve financial independence on a, on a very small salary, as long as you're spending less than you're earning. And um, yeah, you don't need a massive income to, uh, to save money. There are people that have done it with very, very modest incomes. And, uh, and there's a ton of examples I can share with you online of people who are saying, hey, I'm a teacher and I'm going to retire in my early 50s, you know, a decade ahead of all my peers. And it's from these very small saving decisions that I'm making along the way. So yeah, these are, these are myths. Yeah, totally agree. As we conclude this conversation, I want to spend a little bit time, um, maybe away from money, but this might touch on money, but I want to talk about happiness. Um, if anybody sub subscribes to your daily email, 5am uh, Joel, or they read your blogs, you see a through line with happiness with a lot of the things that you're talking about. Even though you might be talking about money, you're ultimately talking about time and happiness and, and how this tool of money can get you to those things. Um, so it seems like your biggest focus currently is happiness. Is that true? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you, you know, I made a, I make a habit out of, um, being happy. So yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a big focus. Yeah, absolutely. And, and when you say you make a habit out of it, <laughs> how do you make that habit? So, uh, let's backtrack a little bit um i personally believe that happiness is a choice uh you can choose to be happy or you can choose not to be happy um with every situation that's presented to you um whether it's pouring your cup of cup of coffee 
or like a big global pandemic, you can choose your response. I'm not saying you have to be happy about your, you know, the pandemic. Um, however, there are definitely positives that come out of it. Try and focus on those. So anyway, for, it, it really comes down to daily appreciation. It's appreciation for the good things that you do have versus the bad things that you don't. And so, yeah, I believe that happiness is a choice. And if you choose it daily and repeat, you know, happy day, happy day, happy day, you, you actually have an advantage in life. It actually opens up more opportunities for you. People think, um, and it actually builds to a more successful life. People think it's the opposite way around. They think if I achieve success, I will be happy. Mm -hmm. I think, hey, you can build happiness and that'll lead to success. Um, not as a milestone, but it will lead to a successful life. You will live success, not achieve it one day. You'll live it. So that's the train I'm on. And, um, you know, I've studied happiness over the last couple of years um, and just, uh, yeah, just trying to like um, increase little bits of happy and share it with others as well. Yeah. That's, yeah. I, 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 I want you to share one story of when you chose happiness, because I think this perfectly illustrates what, what you're trying to allude to. I remember you telling a story that uh, it was when you were living in Hawaii and it seemed like you had a rough week or something and a couple of your buddies were trying to get you out at the bar and <sighs> you finally decided to get out to the bar around 11 p.m. Uh, can you pick up that story and tell us where that night led? Dude, best night of my life. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for reminding me. I, I love this story. I was um, sitting in my apartment feeling sorry for myself. I had a tough work, work week and like, you know, everyone has that. I was so stuck in my own head and whatnot. And my friends were inviting me out and I just wasn't in the mood. And I kept saying, no, 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 don't, don't want to go out. Like, I don't want to be negative around everyone else. And anyway, I finally dragged myself out. It was 11 p.m. I got down to the pub and I just, everything was annoying me. You know, when everyone else is drunk and you're sober, is the most annoying thing. And I was so frustrated. And I was just like, this girl came up to me and she was like, you want to dance? And I was like, not really. <laughs> I just, I got to get out of here. So I actually left. I was headed for the door. And then I just had this like brain, like just this click, like this flick of a switch. And I thought everyone else around me is like happy. And I'm not like, that is so dumb. What am I doing? Why am I thinking this? I am going to choose to be happy. I'm going to choose to change my attitude. And so I went to the bar and I ordered two pints of Guinness and I went back to my friends and said, I've got two beer. I'm here to be happy and have a great night. And from then on, um, I was just like magically like in it. Um, I met my wife that night. I met this girl and uh, she is, um, she's the best. She's my entire world has been well over 10 years. And um, one of the things she says is like, oh yeah, that night I just really, um, you know, liked you and you struck me as a really happy person. And I thought, wow, if she met me like just one hour early, it'd be a completely different story. So anyway, yeah, change your attitude, like really changes your life. So keep a positive attitude every day and um, it, it builds a great life. So. I love that story so much because that one decision in your life would have been, I'm assuming, so, so different from what it is right now. You might not have even made it to LA. You could have been a completely different person. Like you found, you know, your perfect match then. It was, it was such a cool story when I heard you tell that story. I was like, man, I have to let him tell that story again on the show. And <laughs> my favorite uh, takeaway from researching you was this question that you pose. And um, you, you said, am I having a bad day? Or did I have a bad five minutes and that, I, and that I'm milking that for the entire day. And like that, that question, that mindset shift was like, uh, because we, we've all been there. Like we've all had a bad five minutes. And then the majority of the time, myself included, I let that five minutes ruin the rest of my day or maybe the rest of my week um, and spoil great opportunities like your, like you had to, turn around, go get two pints of Guinness and just decide to have a good night and, you know, maybe find, find that person or whatever it is. So I love that story so much. Thanks for sharing it. Um, we didn't even get to talk about 5am Joel and your newsletter. So I, I want to give a brief moment to tell a little bit about that in case anybody wants to go out there and subscribe. Can you, so can you tell us a, a little bit about 5am Joel? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, so it started about four years ago. Um, I got up every morning. At, I get up every morning at 5 a.m. And um, actually, the funny thing about uh, 5 a.m., it's it, your podcast name, The Struggle is Real, like is so spot on. Every day is a struggle to get up early. It's actually, um, it's still really difficult for me. I'm not a morning person. I don't spring out of bed. Um, it is a daily struggle, but so much goodness comes out of it. Um, so what I do is I get up every morning, um, I make a quick note, um, I got in the habit of sending these little emails out to my direct team uh, at work when I was working and that's sort of um, gone public since then. So now I get up and send a short little email. Um, sometimes it's just like a, hey, how you doing? Let's have a great day. Sometimes it's a bit of a, a fun story, maybe a joke, uh, a little positive, just sending good vibes into the world. And so, and people seem to like it. So they're jumping on my email list from all around the world. Um, if you want to check it out, you can go to 5amjoel.com and uh, you can check out all my past emails and subscribe to new ones and stuff like that. So yeah, it's kind of a fun little um, hobby website for me. So. Yeah, it's it's um I, I tell people if they want to put a smile on their on their face in the morning, subscribe to the newsletter. Like the other one the other day with the uh street sweeper and the banana peel. I just I just laughed at that. I giggled at that. I thought it was so great. Dude, that is so cool. You know, actually one of the one of the coolest things about having an email list is the getting the replies. And I've got to figure out a way to make this public. But you know, I send an email out in the morning of a funny story that happened to me, and I get 10 responses from funny stories that happened to other people, and they are hilarious. Um, so I'm doing my best to share all these stories. The street sweep one was really good. Yeah. Um, and these people all around the world. The other day I got an email from this um this lady in Mumbai who just said, Good morning from Mumbai. Here is a bird that I saw out of my window and here's a recording of the sound that it's making it's so beautiful today I thought man this is that's the most amazing thing in the world and so yeah that's uh that's that's what I'm trying to share to people this day it's just, just this tiny little positive note in the morning sets the tone for the day and uh yeah so and you can also reach out to me on there if there's anything on this podcast that I haven't covered um shoot me a note just like Justin did um I'll have a phone call with you I mean <laughs> maybe <laughs> buy me yeah. a beer <laughs> yeah, sure. um and if and if people are looking for more tactical advice they want to learn a little bit about personal finance real estate uh you alluded to it earlier but you're now blog writing at a blog called budgets are sexy so people can go and go to budgetsaresexy.com and check out you write over there twice a week is that yep twice a week cool and real estate personal finance what other things have you talked about yeah, it's actually a website owned by The Motley Fool. Um, so they're big into personal finance and investing and whatnot. Um, I'm uh, catered more to the fire movement and how to be financially independent and setting up these small habits. Um, there's nothing I exclude on the site. It's not like I've got specific opinions on uh, random like Bitcoin and buying gold and all this weird stuff. Um, I just talk general finance and I'm, I'm a supporter of everything. So uh, yeah, check it out. A couple posts a week and um, it's all edited and approved by <laughs> you know, uh, The Motley Fool. So it's not just a random blog, but um, yeah, it's uh, yeah. Check it out. Yeah. There's lots of good stuff over there. So Joel, my final question for you is if you had the opportunity to teach a 16 week class to a group of graduating college seniors um, around a topic that maybe isn't always covered in the classroom, what would you teach and how would you teach it? <laughs> what? You didn't prep me for this question. <laughs> my fault. You can take a minute. I, uh, you can take as no, long. <laughs> no, I love it. Yeah. Put me on the spot. Uh, let's see. Um, graduating seniors, high school or college? Did let's you go, say? Let's go with college. College? Oh, I never went to college. Um, <laughs> I have no idea what these guys think. Um, I would just say that, uh, focus on, um, focus on happiness, um, would probably be the course that I would teach. It's how to be happy no matter what job you have and no matter how much money you have. Mm. Um, how I'd teach it is I don't know, a series of Zoom classes of doing <laughs> fun stuff. Maybe I'd get everyone up at 5 a.m. and we'd go meet at the ocean and go surf together or something like that. Um, show them a different side of life than just the cubicle that they're probably about to step into, mm. thinking that will solve all their problems. So yeah, I think uh, happiness. 
<laughs> I would, I love that so much. And I would totally sign up for that class. So Joel, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Um, hopefully this isn't our last conversation. I'd love to bring you back on. I have a plethora of other notes. We didn't hit on tons of different things, but um, as of right now, thanks so much for sharing everything. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, this definitely won't be our last call. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you like this conversation today, be sure to subscribe so you'll be notified about new episodes. If you want to connect with me, send me a message on Instagram. I'm at Justin Lee Peters. You can find show notes with links to everything we discussed today at justinpeters.co. This episode was produced by Gabby Dimeke. I'm your host, Justin Peters. Thanks for tuning in.